วะระหะทุธรรมะธรรมุทัสสนะโมทัสสะวะกวาทุอะระหะทุธรรมะธรรมุทัสสนะโมทัสสะวะกวาทุอะระหะทุธรรมะธรรมุทัสสะอาปารุธาเดสังอมตสทาวราเยสุรวันทาบมุจันทุสถังเหลือเพียงสักวันเดียวของการปฏิบัติของท่านที่รู้จักและที่รู้จักและที่รู้จักและที่รู้จักและที่รู้จักและที่รู้อินทูเอ่อ the question always arises how to how should I practice when I go home <laughs> because as I pointed out in the beginning this is a, a kind of laid on affair where everything is kind of set up provided as uh, an ideal idyllic situation uh, and but it's you know it's a It does give you a chance to say just uh, live in a in a rather unique way for a couple of weeks, in which you begin to notice things about yourself and your experience that you you probably would not notice so clearly or would overlook in a more ordinary situation. One thing, getting so not talking in the si- silence and in the stillness and the the ordered life uh, that we live during this retreat, then w- with a, like a sensory deprivation, the, sen- the, the amount of sensory impingement is minimal. So recognize that is one uh, as if you're not being con- stimulated in a, uh, highly by. Through the senses, when you get to when you're like kind of letting go of, of just reactivity and of self obsessions and duties, responsibilities, and all the rest, then you begin to notice the the natural state of being in this awareness, and that's very important to see that to get to to know that because we generally don't notice, we forget, and we the world. The real world, quote unquote, is uh, you know kind of screams and yells and and uh, tells us all kinds of things, and all couched in the forms of what we should and shouldn't do or be. But in terms of recognizing what a real refuge is. In in that place where there is balance, peace, clarity, stillness, which you're beginning to recognize is through direct experience, not just a, an idea anymore. Well, how do we maintain that in the day when we go back home and back to the place where we work? Uh, Where everything, the sensory impingement is so strong. So this is where uh, how to integrate practice in daily life. In the monastic form, you have, you do have, you have an ordered life basically uh, set around uh, uh, the morning puja, morning evening chanting, and the uh, phases of the moon and the meal and and the uh, Robes and the bowl and the things that are monastic. You're you're using that as as references for reflection, composing yourself, establishing mindfulness around the robe or the alms bowl or the food or the every morning, every evening. There's a puja, 
the bowing, the chanting, mm. and so forth. These, these all help, you know, if used uh, skillfully, if used in the right way, to to uh, help us to remember that still point, that collected place of awareness in the present. But we still can, monks are still pretty good at doing all this thing in a perfunctory way. You know, because any, any convention becomes perfunctory. You can, you get used to it and you can just go th- through the motions. Uh, because it becomes habitual then. But in, but our efforts now aren't to be caught up in the momentum of habits that we're, uh, and not to develop new habits, but to use conventions to develop, to, to sustain awareness and to remind us of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So for lay people, you have to figure this out in your own uh, living situation, considering the people you're living with and uh, that we find, you know, some if your your say your your partner is not interested in meditation, <laughs> or, or there's all kinds of conflicts around uh, uh, the people that we live with and that we work with, because uh, meditation is if, is oftentimes seen as a threat. People see it as uh, something that's going to you know, you're going to change and and be different. And you're not going to be the 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 one who you know you're used to and who will go along with and do all the things that you you're used to doing. So we have to take that into account: how to live and and sustain our practice within the conditions that that we have. And so recognize that this is a, this is a, an ideal condition, you know, where it's directed, it's focused, it's uh, supportive in every way. Uh, so this is, you know, this is uh, one of the best. Uh, and, and so you reflect that it, when things are at their best, uh, but you can't live like, there's not even monks and nuns that can live on in such a way uh, as, a, as an ongoing practice, this is an extreme. So the same monastic life is around the ordinariness of monastic daily life, rather than a a very special meditation retreat situation. So this is a the divinaya discipline of the monk, and the the um, the monastic routine the the life, the daily life, is 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 supportive towards mindfulness. And of course, we are living in a community where everybody is uh, kind of supporting each other as best we can toward this. So that that is very good. But in say the world, maybe this is not possible. But then you can take that into account. Don't see it as a an obstruction that. That means you can't practice, but it means that you it's something you have to take into account in your practice to bring into consciousness the the kind of situation you're in, the people you're living with, the responsibilities that you have, a professional situation you're in, uh, and all the uh, contributing factors to the experience of daily life, so that you're you're not not to to uh, criticize or complain, but to just accept and notice that these things one can uh, be aware of, can actually use. In monastic communities, as much as we, we're all kind of dedicated to the same goal and have the same aspiration, but yet uh, there's a lot of suffering around personal conflicts. Uh, Two, you know, it's, ama- it's always quite, you know, it's a, when you contemplate the, 
the uh, quality of people that enter the monastic life and they, uh, you know, it's like cream of the crop, really. People are very morally responsible and committed and in every way to uh, a spiritual goal, willing to give up old worldly uh, pleasures, renounce, be celibate, and live in a restrained and and give up personal freedom to just do and go and say what you want. Uh, and so there's a high level of, of uh, you know, personal commitment and responsibility. And yet, in a monastery, there's a, a lot of suffering around personality conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> So really good people, spiritually uh, developed and aspiring people, uh, can uh, uh, also oftentimes cannot get along with each other very well. <laughs> so don't don't think that this is just a lay person's problem. <laughs> But then that's part of life, isn't it? When we're contemplating the world, not a complaint, but but that's that's what we, that's part of our experience. On the 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 the, the, emp- the the different ways we just move or look or the uh, position we're in or the kind of uh, way we whether we're born under what star sign or or whether we're <laughs> from what generation or from what cultural background, or class, or race, or gender, and all these things do, have, you know, are causes of misunderstanding. Hmm. It's easy, or if they just say, say like Americans and English people to totally misunderstand each other. Separated by a common language, I think. <laughs> they are of very good intention and very, very uh, committed to the same thing, but oftentimes really misunderstanding the way, just the way we talk, or the, the, the assumptions we're making are different. And so, even on that, then there's like the. Uh, the different, say, from Asian countries, we have Sri Lankans and Thais and Cambodians, and we have different European nationalities and and Australian, New Zealanders, and and all like that, um, living in under the same discipline, the same aspiration, and yet uh, uh, there there can be um, really. Uh, you know, a lot of, of angst and anguish or rage over just because the way it, the expectation of the assumptions we're making are quite different. Or then around the gender of the body, the, the nuns, they, and the monks. A lot of really misunderstandings between male and female because. Uh, they're very different in what they, how they think and react to life. You may have noticed. <laughs> or different age groups. Uh, just uh, the fact that uh, different generations, like like my generation, I'm living in a community of people who are all considerably younger than I am. So, you know, sometimes I find the, the, the kind of, I kind of get bewildered by <laughs> certain things because <laughs> I've been a monk for over 30 years I, and they talk about all these things that have happened between 1960 and 1997. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about at the time. 
<laughs> but these things needn't be problems that, that uh, uh, in terms of they, you know to be taken into account that's why we're we're looking at the mind rather than trying to solve all these things and trying to get perfect understanding and rapport and, and each culture each and we have to iron out all the wrinkles and all the misunderstandings between the men and women and between the d- different generations and different cultures, ethnic backgrounds, personalities, star signs, and so <laughs> forth. It, it, <laughs> and it's like, you know, I want to I wanna go off to my cave. <laughs> I want to be alone. Leave me alone. I can't bear it. It's too complicated. Uh, because on that level, it's hopeless. You're trying to, to have perfect harmony and understanding, mutual respect, and, and, uh, and that with, uh, between even a, a, a group of people, say, in, in a monastery like this, that are all extremely fine people in themselves. Same aspirations, same commitment. So you have to work in a different level on that, on that. That's what meditation is getting to, to the realization of truth that is beyond transcending then can, uh, the, all these different things that affect this, our, our lives, our daily lives. This is where we, we, and we also develop a lot of wisdom because of this. If we, I think if we live in a cave, we probably don't develop much wisdom. Maybe we develop the wisdom that's necessary to live in a cave. But when you get outside of that, you probably don't know what to do. Uh, so I remember in early years in Thailand, I'd, I'd have to sometimes and be living in the forests in the northeast, and then, then I have to go to Bangkok for something. And the idea was, Bangkok was a terrible place that you couldn't practice. It it ruined your samadhi. Uh, it was uh, noisy and uh, dirty and uh, uh, too many distractions. And so the, the the common assumption among Western monks, anyway, was that uh, you went. You try to avoid going to Bangkok at all costs, only for necessary things, and and then uh, get your work. if you had to, then you go and you you get back to your cave as soon as quickly as possible. Uh, and the attitude was Bangkok was, uh, you know, like a, a place you can't be mindful in, you can't practice. So I contemplated that. I thought, what what is mindfulness if it's if it's dependent upon a situation? You can only be mindful in a cave or in a forest. That doesn't that doesn't seem like mindfulness to me. That seems like you're getting dependent upon a place. That you you're assuming that in order for you to get enlightened, you have to you have to depend on a place, uh, and and so that you can get all the right thing, control all the right things, and 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 then hopefully get what you want from that. So just noticing that assumption that the, the idea that Bangkok is uh, you can't practice in Bangkok I began to see that was just a, an opinion that that seemed true I mean it seemed at the time you know that that was the way it is that Bangkok was difficult and noisy and all that's true but one can still be mindful in Bangkok and so uh, changing the attitude towards uh, rather than just grasping the idea the, the bias against Bangkok letting go of that one and just le- learning to, to use the situation uh, that one is in you know if you're in Bangkok then this is where you, you're mindful or wherever you are you, you, you can be mindful of that 
So because of that, I never found Bangkok an obstruction to practice or that, that my practice somehow diminished and became worse in Bangkok it, uh, because I, I, was, I, I was determined to use the experience there uh, for, with mindfulness and, and with wisdom. That doesn't mean that I, that I liked, I mean, I've never liked living there. I don't like living in big cities anyway. So it isn't a, you know, a, a wanting to live there, but, 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 uh, so that, you know, one, I would naturally gravitate to the more, uh, uh, rural places, the forests, when that's possible, but, but not to assume, make assumptions or attachments, so that the the life, the meditation is more of a flowing situation rather than a fixed one. In daily life, you uh, bring into your mind the, what the, the the situation you're in, and then see what you can do with it, like. Like just they say formal practice. Well, how how can you say practice? Do formal meditation practice in daily life? How can you integrate that into your daily routine or responsibilities or family life? That's something you have to figure out for yourself. How to do that, knowing the the the, the situation you're in. But it's very good too. Uh, use formal practice as just like an exercise or do anapanasati uh, mindfulness of the breath or relaxation exercises or or the sound of silence help to always establish uh, bring you back into the you know even though your mind may be wandering all over the place to compose yourself in uh, at times during the day So I found that uh, say one can do say formal sittings and and maybe what well, maybe you can only do it fifteen minutes in the morning or whatever it's still better than not doing it uh, even if it's only five minutes it's still better to or even it's better to think even one minute is better than not bothering or even thinking the idea I should meditate. <laughs> But if, but to establish uh, the, the uh, morning and evening practice that is, uh, say, not disrupting your family life or being uh, inconsiderate and rude to or uh, to the family or the people you're living with, but uh, which you can, which you feel is is right and and suitable. That's for something that you have to to figure out. Also, with the sound of silence, I found that very useful as a way of of uh, integrating practice. Because, uh, uh, say, in traffic jam, like in Bangkok, where they have these terrible traffic jams, uh, people complain about it all the time. Traffic jams, and yet one can practice meditation very well in traffic jam. If you're stuck in a traffic jam for half an hour, you've got half an hour is anapanasati. And sound of silence, <laughs> or, and or watch the irritation or the, the the mental agitation you create around uh, you know this this anticipating or this kind of this uh, restless feeling of wanting to get somewhere and not be stuck. Or you can you can use the situation for just for developing awareness around what you're feeling. I have found in a traffic jam I. The mind, the mind is always wanting to. You know, you feel this desire to move, and you you feel this kind of irritation, frustration at not being able to move. And then, then you, then the traffic starts moving a bit, and you can. Kind of, now we're going, and then it stops again. <laughs> so you can <laughs> observe this, be the observer of this emotional reaction to 
to just the experience of being stuck in a traffic jam. We can use these frustrating situations in, as Dhamma practice rather than than uh, being caught up in the usual uh, grumbling or negative reactions to them that we usually produce. So this is developing wisdom, isn't it? We're now taking wisdom and using it uh, with the experiences that we have in life. I find you know, the sound of times are useful to work with with people in in uh, in like in meetings. It helps to center me and not and to uh, to help me to to kind of empty my mind out rather than than uh, just be caught in reactivity to what people say. So we've been in some of the we've been having these uh, kind of uh, meetings sometimes called process meetings, uh, where the where you're supposed to talk about how you feel and and things like that with each other. And so you, this uh, and oftentimes this is uh, you feel this this sense of very of vulnerability when you're talking about how you feel in a group. Uh, because we, you know, my generation, we never talked about how we felt in a group, and so we. Uh, this is quite a, quite a new idea, new experience. But, the <laughs> but I observed the kind of the feelings of nervousness whenever these meetings come around. And kind of you get the kind of butterflies, the uh, feeling, the things start kind of nervous sensations in your guts, uh, the idea of having to talk about personal feeling in a group that uh, a group of, of monks is uh, brings up this these feelings. Just not, not because it's the fault of the monks or even myself, but this is just what I'm noticing, being aware of of how things affect this body and this this being when uh, when these kind of uh, conditions exist, or when people criticize, or when people criticize, right? Like uh, people in the past several years have been quite critical of me, so that so that I've I've had to use that as a means of of practice to be able to. To notice the the effect of you know the, the emotional reaction uh, and physical reaction to the what they call sharing. They say, let me share something with you, I don't know. <laughs> but in some ways it's very, it's very, it's very good to, to, to do that because, you know, you, it, it helps to bring into consciousness of a lot of fear and, and uh, feelings of being threatened and being, or misunderstood, all these kind of emotions. Uh, or feeling it, uh, on feeling one is being treated unfairly or criticized unfairly. So that the aim is to to be able to recognize these these emotional reactions in terms of dhamma. They arise and they cease. And when it's getting into personal things, it get the emotions get increasingly more kind of real. Powerful. And when, it, when it's about something else, when we have business meetings and talking about 
things like that, is somehow they, it's, it, you're ta- it's not so strong. But when you're getting into personal things, then it brings up a lot of, ang- of fear and, and uh, of being rejected or being exposed or being humiliated in some way or being put down. Well, these are part of our human experience this, this, uh, in the in the world. So that that this also can be seen in terms of dhamma. So I find with emotional, uh, personal emotional problems, uh, uh, things I I do try to focus on the feelings in the body, the trunk of the body. Uh, so just to be able to sustain attention on on the situa- on the, on the actual feeling that that I'm having and the physical feeling like if if uh, um, somebody is is saying something I don't like I don't want to hear or I don't agree with and then uh, I could either argue back or you know walk out of the room or or just shut down, refuse to listen, or I can look at, you know, listen, and 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 pay attention to the, the feelings in the in the body. So I found this this very strengthening ability to, say, listen to to be able to keep my attention on, on the feelings I hear. Somebody's uh, criticizing me. And then I, I'm listening. The sound of silence, and I'm sustaining, and I'm concentrating on the, on the feelings, the tensions, and the, down in here. Usually, when when you're being criticized, I usually feel it down here. <laughs> so I, I, I by by practicing with that, then I. I find that uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm not getting if I if I use bodily feeling then that stops and the sound of silence I can stop the thinking process and then I can and then that lingering uh, emotion that hangs around and the physical sensations as you as you embrace those accept those then they then they'll change and they'll cease. And that's a very wonderful way for developing a lot of strength in, in in being able to to listen to other people, to to reflect and try to understand uh, what people are saying, or trying to even understand yourself better, rather than just be caught in reactivity and and uh, controlling and manipulating a scene to protect yourself. So in terms of what we've been doing this, these two weeks, it, it integrates well into a very stressful situation also. It, but it does take wisdom and the willingness to use the experiences of life. With the self, oftentimes we've got a lot of pride and a lot of fear to deal with, so they, that, that, that sometimes one doesn't want to hear, or one just wants to, you know, go off to the cave, and leave me alone uh, reaction, which I, you know, can fully appreciate and understand, but also there's this other way of dealing with it, which I find a very strengthening approach. It makes me unafraid of life. Before I was, I had a lot of fear around life, you know. And uh, when I was a lay person, I was a very controlling kind of person. I would, I got myself through university and all kinds of situations because I could manipulate and control things for my own benefits and a kind of survival survivalist mind 
and so I, I could, uh, in, in the system I lived in, I could, you know, I learned how to operate and protect myself. But I also had a lot of, of self-aversion because of that, uh, I, self-loathing, and, uh, and also a lot of ang- uh, fear and inability to listen to people or try to just react I'd get I'd just be very reactive and defensive towards other people it makes it impossible for anyone to live you can't li- live with anyone like that very long or very well so I was married two years <laughs> <laughs> Wife couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> so the <laughs> so these are the these are the they kind of because there are a lot of fear. Yeah, if if, they, if things got into a place where one was being threatened, then I could get very uh, very fierce and and rage and rage would take over and be very frightening. So this is this is uh, say neurotic, yes, but it it's also a result of having of you know not understanding things and not knowing how to deal with stressful situations or how to develop a relationship with somebody else. It was more or less based on ideals like romantic ideals, the marriage with. Was a kind of a romantic ideal. One liked the idea of it and the romantic part of it. I mean, you can't, you know, that's the, the, to sustain that as an ongoing way of relating to each other is impossible. <laughs> and then you get down to the to the, uh, to the practicalities of of uh, the of being with each other and, and irritating each other and misunderstanding each other and threatening and criticizing and resenting and hating and loving and fearing and so forth that, that we have in regards to uh, people that we live, we share our lives with. So this kind of practice also helps to deal with those kind of problems. In fact, that because one develop, I've developed this practice, then those kind of situations don't frighten me anymore. I can, I'm quite open and willing to uh, walk into the lion's den. <laughs> <laughs> or try to get through the snake pit. Or the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've been married for thirty-one years now. <laughs> I think we marry the Dhamma, which is uh, which uh, I I'm quite happy with. It's been a good it's been a good marriage. So this sense of fearlessness comes from understanding the the Dhamma, or the way things are, understanding yourself. And through understanding yourself also you under, you know, you, you you understand the problems of others. And then much more compassion and and gentleness and kindness come from that understanding. So in the in meditation practice, see, don't see it as just a sitting on a on a zafu, uh, shutting everyone out, but but see how to develop it into an awareness. Because with this sound of silence, it gives you a, a kind of expansive container in which your own gut feelings and the people you're that are 
impinging on you. It can be, you know, in that moment, it, it, it all fits together, and you can you can use that situation rather than then run away to a to a cave and where you can get one pointed concentration on on an object. So this is intuitive awareness where you, you remember intuition is a, is whole. It takes on everything. So it it embraces. It takes like this. It's like this. So the, right now there's the sound of silence. I can be aware of the body as it is, the breath, the mood of the mind. I can listen to somebody, or I'm aware of of some of the uh, things around me that that uh, affect me. And through this kind of intuition, I've also just observed how 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 much just natural uh, reactivity there is, uh, just body language, how it affects, how somebody moves or looks or that, of how it affects your conscious experience. And the, this the aggressive gestures or angry looks, so you feel it, don't you? Walk. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and get, they give you a really mean look, and you feel it. Maybe, the, and you, then you tend to take it personally, like, think, "What did I do? To, what have I done now?" I <laughs> know <laughs> that they've. They're not angry at you, they're angry at somebody else. <laughs> or maybe they're not angry, maybe they're just in a they they're just in a bad mood or they maybe that's how they look when they're not smiling. <laughs> or maybe they're angry at me. <laughs> they're, but it is, just, or the way somebody walks or moves. It, you know, you, you, as you, as you're in the state of awareness, intuitive awareness, you're aware of how just bodily gestures affect consciousness. I can find yourself kind of being startled by just some the way somebody walks toward you, or the the kind of vibrations they send to you. You again, the sensitivity is is including that, but rather than interpreting in through fear and desire and personal uh, explanations, you're, you're contemplating it in terms of Dhamma. So you're, in that way, in that, in that willingness to do so, you're, you're getting beyond just the, the, uh, because the fear is always around, is very personal, you know, just, the the anxiety, the the despair, the, the indignation come usually related to some form of conceit or fear on a personal level. Like none of us like to be humiliated or made to look like a fool in public. So in you find that, but sometimes this happens. So. so um, this uh, uh, is something to, and, and, uh, and it's a kind of pride, isn't it? Conceit, isn't it? wanting to to appear good all the time and not look foolish, not be made, not to be made fun of. But still, when those things happen, we can we those are, see that as an opportunity rather than. Be caught up in the in the anger, or uh, be carried away by the emotional reaction. Just like I was telling you the other day about a Buddha, being a Buddhist monk when I first came to live in London, and, and people would make fun of me on the street, and call me skinhead and Hare Krishna and, <laughs> and other names that I will not repeat group of polite and refined people. Uh, Hare Krishna and Skinhead are politer versions. But I could I could I, 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 I'd try to get some feeling you know, begin to look at what I 
that sense of being threatened or or that and that resentment that comes from being made fun of so instead of uh, wallowing in or suppressing but using that to get in touch with that that kind of emotional reaction helps a lot to to give you a confidence and strength strengthens you in your in your life as a as a member of this society So these are really valuable tools, which, which uh, uh, I hope you don't think are just, you can only use at Amravati retreats. <laughs> that, well, uh, you know, this is like the practice ground, you know, the, the uh, training course. Uh, the real practice is in the daily life. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening.